Coming up on Foundation for Life with Dr. Waylon Bailey. This is what children should do today. This is what parents should do today. This is what husbands and wives and grandparents and all of us should do today. Make the most of this day and give it to God and glorify Him in all the things that we do. Our scripture today is from Jeremiah 29, and I'm going to begin reading with verse 4. Jeremiah, I had to come back to Jeremiah one more time. I just could not stand it, uh, because this is a great passage of scripture. It is very practical. It is very real world and real life. Uh, it is a message of hope, and it tells us how to make it day by day, because that's what we all want to know. How do I make it day by day? Uh, So here's what you need to know about this passage of Scripture. Uh, Jeremiah has been preaching about 30 or 40 years at this point. He has been talking about judgment that was going to come. And the first stage of that judgment had come. The people of Babylon came and captured Jerusalem. They took about 10,000 Jews with them back to Babylon. They selected who those would be. They took members of the royal family. They took army officers. They took uh, business leaders. They took people with specific skills, particularly blacksmiths who could make weapons of war. They were trying to make sure that no revolt happened. Those people were taken to Babylon. Ten years later, Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. In the meantime, God sent a letter to the people of Israel who were captives in Babylon. And these are the contents of that letter. Jeremiah 29 Verse 4, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and daughters and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there and do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper." Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Don't let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon... I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I've banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from the place from which I carried you into exile. What do we do today? What do we do 
for this day that God has given us? I mean, that is the real question. And that's what God was saying to the people from Jerusalem who had been taken exile into Babylon. This is what you do today. This is how you live. This is how you make it. Maybe you're questioning, how do I make it? How do I go on through life? Can I recover from what has happened to me? Can I go ahead with life based on the things that I I am dealing with right now? That's what God was doing for the people who were in Jerusalem, who were the people who were in Babylon from the city of Jerusalem. Now, here's what we think happened. We think that the Jews in Babylon revolted. We think that there was an uprising somewhere around nine, around 595 B.C. They went into exile in 597, 595, 594 B.C. There was an uprising. Good for them. That's what the Jews of the Holocaust should have done. There should have been a rising, a, a self-defense. And so you, you look at that and you think this makes sense. Except this was not God's plan and not God's work. In Jeremiah 21, uh, in 29, in the first verse, Jeremiah says this is the letter that God sent to the elders who survived. Survived what? The trip, maybe, but maybe the uprising. And God was saying to them, this is my plan for you. This is what I want to do. I have plans to you for you to give you hope and to give you a future. So what should we do today based on this passage of scripture? Well, the first thing and the thing that jumps out in my mind is this. We should speak and live truth. We should seek truth. Not my truth, not your truth. One of the favorite expressions today is that's your truth. That's my truth. I have to live my truth. Well, that would not fit what God said to the people of Israel who were exiles in Babylon. God said to them, don't listen to the prophets who are deceiving you. You are egging them on. You are helping them to dream dreams and to see visions that did not come from me that I have not given to them. They are prophesying lies in my name. I did not seek them. We live in a day in which people are seeking their own truth. What I need is not my truth, but God's truth. Not what I can accomplish, but what God can accomplish. Not what I think the world ought to look like, but the, what the creator of the world wants the world to look like and so we seek him and we seek truth and we speak that truth and live that truth do you know what the people around you are desperate for do you know what your family members that maybe you're going to eat lunch with today desperately need do you know what our neighbors our schoolmates our best friends what they need is not to get their way but to follow God's way to not to have their truth but to receive God's truth of all the things that we need for this day is to speak the truth but even more importantly for us to live the truth There's the second thing that you see in this passage of Scripture of what we need for today. And what we need is to live one day at a time and to make the most of this day that God has given us. Where we we understand that this may be the only day that we have. That this may be the day that we have been given and to use it fully and completely to God. At somewhere in the past, I used to know 70 years times 365 days. I used to know that number. 
Well, you know exactly what it is in Scripture. We, we are, we, it's spoken of that we're given three score in 10 years, 70 years, times 365 days. At some point in life, those days become very precious. Well, what God was saying to the people of, of Israel who were in Babylon, live each day, make the most of each day. And, and what should you do making the most of each day? Do those things that are God-ordained. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and harvest the, the food that it produces. And, and have sons and daughters and give your sons and daughters in marriage so that they will have sons and daughters. And here was God's plan. I don't want you to decrease in number. I want you to increase in number because I have a long-term goal for you. And the long-term goal is that you're going to come back and you're going, there's going to be a people, a larger number of people, and they're going to return to Jerusalem, and they're going to rebuild the city, and they're going to rebuild the temple. These, this is the plan that I have for you. So make the most of each day. Live each day to the fullest. Live completely and fully before God, making the best of it that you can. What a difference it makes in life when we live that way. That's what this passage of Scripture is about. This is, this is what you and I should do today. This is what children should do today. This is what parents should do today. This is what husbands and wives and grandparents and all of us should do today. Make the most of this day and give it to God and glorify Him in all the things that we do. There's a third thing, and it's very practical, that you find in this passage of Scripture. Set small goals and set large goals. God gives us this picture. The large goal here is 70 years from now, I'm going to come and get you, and I'm going to take you back to the land from which I took you. Now, most of the people who went into exile were not the ones who returned. Because all you have to do is figure a 50-year-old man was not very likely to live to 120 years of age. So that didn't, probably didn't happen. But what he was saying was, I want there to be a Jewish people who still love me and follow me and obey me, and I want them to come back, and I want them to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and rebuild the temple, and I want them to worship me and serve me, and I want them to be a light unto the Gentiles, and I want them to make a difference. So the long goal, the big goal, is 70 years. So how do you get, how do you accomplish a big goal? Well, you set a whole lot of small goals. And you break the big goal down into little goals. Maybe you've got something that is due next week, next Sunday. How do you, how do you get it done? And maybe you're in some sense overwhelmed with it. How am I going to do this? How am I going to make this work? Well, a very practical way that you can see right here in this passage of Scripture is break it down into small goals. Put it in small pieces and every day take care of some of that goal. If it had been in April and next Sunday was April 15th, how do you get all of that stuff done? Sometimes I find a pile of stuff and you feel overwhelmed by it. Well, what you do is you break it down into seven pieces. And you faithfully carry that out. What was God saying to them? How do we get to, God, how do we get to 70 years? We'll build a house and live in it. Plant a garden and work it every day. And take the produce and feed your family. And raise your children. Show them the ways of the Lord. Don't let them forget what I've given you. Don't let them forget who we are and who you are and raise your children and give your sons and daughters in marriage 
and let them have sons and daughters and don't increase don't decrease but increase in the land where I have sent you there's a fourth thing and it's at the heart of everything here and that is today God wants you to trust his promises now you can see what a difficult time the people of Israel had because they had those prophets who were prophesying lies. There was a prophet, we know from the book of Jeremiah, there was, and let's call, make him a so-called prophet, there was a prophet in Babylon who was preaching and he was saying, thus saith the Lord, just like Jeremiah did. And he said, within two years, God is going to defeat the Babylonians and he's going to take us back to the land of Israel. It was that prophet and others to whom God was referring when he said they are prophesying lies in my name and I did not send them. There was a prophet during the time of Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah. Jeremiah was always acting out sermons. So Jeremiah put on a yoke as, in, as you would use with oxen where two ox were put together. And, and they would work together. They were, they were side by side working. And the message that God had given Jeremiah was, I'm going to yoke the people of Israel with the people of Babylon. And you're going to be yoked with them and you're not going to break that yoke. So a false prophet comes up to Jeremiah, takes the yoke off his shoulders and he breaks the yoke. And here's what he says. He, he lies in the name of the Lord saying, thus saith the Lord, that I will break the yoke of Babylon. So what is God telling them to do? Don't listen to the lying prophets. In the, in the letters of John, John said, test the spirits. Those people are always going to be. Jesus said, I send you out as sheep among wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And of all people, God has commanded us to be wise, to understand uh, spiritual truth and to understand untruth. But what God was saying is, yes, it's going to be 70 years, but I haven't forgotten you. And I haven't forgotten my promises from the very beginning. And I'm not going to forget my promises. So he says in verse 11, I know the plans I have for you, not plans to do evil, but plans to do good, to give you hope and a future. I read someone this week who said, even a little bit of hope keeps us going. Just a thimble full of hope makes a huge difference. And what God was doing was he was overflowing them with hope. And that's what he wants to do with you and me. I know the plans I have for you to give you hope and a future. Those words were specifically given to a small group of people in a specific time period. But those words still apply to us because when you go to the New Testament, you find the New Testament writers talking about the hope that God has given to us and the hope that is secure in him. In fact, Paul says that hope is laid up for you in heaven. It's there. It's waiting for you. Count on it. It's coming. God wants us today to trust his promises. And so he says, I know the plans I have for you. And in verse 12, he says, you're going to call on me. And when you pray, when you call on me, I'm going to listen. I'm going to hear. So why not, when you pray today, why not say, God, just as you said in Jeremiah 29, when you said to the people of Israel, you will pray and I will hear, then I come praying, know that your promises are true and that you do hear my prayer. In verse 13, God says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And in verse 14, he says, and I will be found by you. And I will come 
and I will take you back to the land that I sent you. What was he saying? Think about those verses 11 and 12 and 13 and 14. They're full of promises of hope. What God wanted them to do is trust the promises that I give to you. And what he wants us to do today is trust those promises that I have given to you. And so we have all of those, but we also have, I will never leave you or forsake you. We have the promise where Jesus said, you will come unto me and no one will pluck you out of my hand. We have the promise when Jesus said, go into all the world and take the gospel and share the gospel. What did he say? The promise is, and I will be with you always, even to the end of this age. We are to trust in those promises, and we are to live according to those promises. The fifth thing that is so, uh, so evident in this passage of Scripture is... When he says, you will seek me and you will find me. When you seek me with all your heart. That that verse, verse 13, can be translated just as well. Works either way in the Hebrew language. It works either way. Can be translated when you wholeheartedly seek me. And so that's the way I put the sermon together earlier in the week. I decided to use that word because that word is a little bit different. Maybe you would remember it when you wholeheartedly seek me. So what does God want us to do today? He wants us to wholeheartedly seek him. Now on Saturdays in the fall, there are always two things on my mind. One of them is the sermon that's coming up Saturday night and then the next day. So that's always in the back of my mind. But in the front of my mind on Saturdays is football. So yesterday morning I read an article about a football player, Division I, very good freshman football player, a defensive lineman, a big kid, a strong kid uh, who is already playing and playing well. I read the story about him. He was born in Guffport. He was born in 2001, so that makes him either 18 or 19, maybe 19 years old at this point. He was born in, in, in two, early in 2001, and he's playing football. But, but that wouldn't be the story. Here's the story. His mother was 26 years old. I think she was a single mom. Uh, the boy, the man, was born, was born four months premature. And here's what the, the attending physician said, whomever, I have no idea who it was. This child will never walk. This child will never talk. If this child lives, he will be in a vegetative state. And so our best advice to you is that you let nature take its course. So the interview goes along. So what did you do? Well, she said I was by myself and And I couldn't get over the words that were being said to me. And I couldn't get over what had happened. And there was so much I couldn't do. but, But I came to the conclusion that I was going to fight for my son. And I was going to do the best that I could. And the story describes how she would go and hold her son. And when she held her son, she would hold him in the palm of her hand. I had, Martha and I had the distinct, wonderful privilege of doing that with a child in this church, with that family. And I held this little girl in the palm of my hand. So she said, I decided I was going to fight for my son. And she described all that. 
And so then they fast forward, and now here's your son. He's in civil engineering. He made all A's in high school. He obviously is walking and talking and running and hitting and doing all the things that he is doing. How did you ever get him to this point? And here are the words that just jumped out. Exact words. She said, I wholeheartedly sought. God and she said that became the principle for raising my son that's what God wants for you and me that we wholeheartedly seek God that we say God today is your day God this year is your year God, my family, my income, my resources, this is yours. Not my house, your house. Not my garden, your garden. God, I give it all to you. I wholeheartedly seek you. Of all the things that we need to do today, it is to wholeheartedly seek him and give ourselves to him, to let him lead, to let him show us his way to let him help us to know what we do this day. If you go through the Bible, here's what you would understand. That you don't, you don't hear the word of the Lord and then say, that was nice, and go off and forget it. But you hear the word of the Lord and you ask God, what do you want me to do? And you hear the word of the Lord and and you take the word and, and apply it to your own life and you say, God, I want what you want and I wholeheartedly give myself unto you. I wholeheartedly seek you. I want to ask that you would do that. That you would say unto God, God, I wholeheartedly come unto you a lot of different people here and all of us have a little bit different situation there's some of you who have never really thought about God but the spirit of God is working and touching you and now you are you are in that process maybe you would be the person who say I I want to know God, and I, I want to move along in the process. But maybe you've been a believer for 40 years, and you've said, I just need more of God than I've had. Wherever you are, would you say to God now, I wholeheartedly seek you. Live on the North Shore or planning to visit? Join us here at First Baptist Church Covington for one of our three weekend services. Come be encouraged by Dr. Bailey every Saturday evening at 6 or Sunday mornings at 9.30 or 11 a.m. For more information and directions to our church, visit fbccov.org. First Baptist Church Covington. Experience life-changing relationships. Be sure to tune in again next week for Foundation for Life.